first of all, I want to thank the organizers of this and the Internet Society for uh, inviting me and actually Nicole Brideson, my friend, who's a journalist, founder of Brooklyn the Borough, hyper-local, uh, worker-owned, uh, user-generated media platform, independent. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Guerin. Some of you know me. Uh, many of you may have heard about me, and a lot of you probably have no idea who I am. So um, I, I come to this forum because um, what we're looking at right now, there's a burning question is, is what is this notion of democracy in the digital realm? And so I want to ask you all a question. How many believe there is such a thing? Raise your hand. Everybody, everybody who believes there is such a thing as a free speech democracy in cyberspace. You, you, is this a consensus? Everybody believes that? Okay. Let me ask another question. When you're shopping in Kmart, what are your constitutional rights? Anybody want to? Anybody want to volunteer that? <laughs> no, no. What? No, specific, I'm serious. This is not a joke. What are your constitutional rights when you shop in Kmart? They are restricted. Question is, let me ask a little bit more specifically. Do you have any? Plenty of speech? No, you're, you're restricted because you're on private property. This guy knows. Okay, the answer is no. When you're shopping in Kmart, when you're in Starbucks, when you're in the mall, there are no constitutional protections. Welcome to the internet. The internet is Kmart. When you're on the internet, you do not have constitutional rights. What you have is a contract, right? Well, what happens when you sign up? You know, you go to the thing with the F, the thing with the T, the thing with the G, A, right? I don't even need to say their names. I'm not going to advertise for them because you're already indoctrinated. But what happens when you go there and you sign up? What do you do? Anybody? Yes. No, and nobody reads it. Doesn't matter because, well, actually, it does matter, and people should read it because what you're doing there is you're not agreeing to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. What you're doing is, is actually you're waiving your rights. You're waiving your rights. My, my FIOS, TOS says that if I post uh, off-topic comments in an internet forum, they can shut off my internet. <laughs> Point taken. So to start off with a thesis that democracy in cyberspace is something that we need to draft, author, create, agree to, is really a fool's errand. And why is that? Well, I don't want to sound like Bill Clinton when he ran, uh, when he said it's the economy stupid, but I'm going to say it. I don't like to call anybody stupid, so forgive me. It's the oligarchy stupid. It's the oligarchy. Going to the FCC, we'll talk about many things, but that's, our, that's the premise. So first of all, there is no democracy in cyberspace. You're at Kmart. You're at Starbucks. It's the same in the digital realm. When, when Stanley Cohen talked about the PayPal 14 and what happened was, uh, for people who don't understand that, just very quickly, uh, you know, WikiLeaks released uh, Manning's documents and it was very damaging. And WikiLeaks, uh, everybody thinks, oh, that's journalism. That's the fourth estate. That's a First Amendment protection. These guys have every uh, right and we should empower them to be the watchdogs, to be the whistleblowers, to, to uh, convey this information. What happened? Where did they host? They were hosted on Amazon Cloud. What happened with PayPal? PayPal, WikiLeaks didn't violate their, they didn't even violate their contract. It was by a whim. It was a political move that PayPal stopped processing those transactions. And what did Amazon Cloud do? They shut them down. So you don't have any freedom of speech. You don't have any First Amendment. Everybody says, oh, free speech, First Amendment. And you don't have it in cyberspace. What you have is like, uh, you know, if at best you're living in a rent-controlled apartment where your landlord wants to kick you out or raise your rent. 
and you don't have any of that. So when Amazon shut down WikiLeaks, they didn't violate their contract either. Did, were they paying their bill? Of course they were paying their bill. But they were doing something unpopular. Something unpopular that did what? Challenge the power structure. And now, and so, and what happened with these uh, anonymous folks? What did they do? They were charged, in a sense, with a type of attack on the critical infrastructure. That's, that can be called cyber war. That could be called terrorism. These people were charged, as Stanley said, with very, very serious charges. Stanley was very humble because what he really managed to do was to change the perception of the prosecution that the PayPal 14 incident was not terrorism. This was free speech. They were exercising their free speech by doing a sit-in because the DOS or denial of service or distributed denial of service attack in that realm of hacktivism, of this collective action in protest against this de facto censorship, if you will, was akin to blocking an intersection. That it was like sitting at the lunch counter. It was uh, another way of protest and that's a First Amendment right. So this wasn't cyber terrorism at all. What kind of damage does a DDoS do? It doesn't do any damage to the systems. They didn't extract any data. All they did was they blocked people from doing transactions with PayPal. Why? Because PayPal unfairly discontinued service to somebody who wasn't even breaking their agreement. Why? Political reasons. So what it comes down to is who owns the internet? That's another question I like to, I like to ask people is, uh, where's the internet and who owns it? And as we can see, uh, it's owned by a small few of the, the less than 1%. And what's happening is, and I don't know if anybody uh, watches PBS. Did anybody watch the Frontline series that's on lately now? OK. And last night was especially revealing. And, and uh, for me, honestly, Listening to what happened, what Snowden revealed to me is a vindication. Because I've been saying this for 20 years. For me, in 1994, WWW meant worldwide wiretap. And the surveillance isn't anything new. They were already changing the telecommunications laws requiring equipment manufacturers for phone switches in the 90s. This is what really, before even internet. I wasn't introduced to the internet until 1992, 93, uh, the UNESCO fellow in Germany. And uh, I was already reading it that the telecom switches had to have wiretap capabilities built in. And guess who paid for it? Rate hikes. So the subscribers paid. So this is nothing new. The, the, the uh, man from AT&T, when he spotted the, the splitters in the fiber optics and how the NSA was tapping it, there's nothing new. It's just more advanced. And you're all in it. And everyone who feeds into this system, there's no way out. So you can write all the documents you want, but it's wishful thinking unless you can change that contract. Unless, unless we empower ourselves to build, create an economic and sustainable case to build, own, and operate our own infrastructure. And if I were to say that, if we were to do anything, because I don't think we need to rewrite any kind of rights, documents, whatever, all respect to those who want to do a cyber Magna Carta, because we have a fantastic document called the United States Constitution. Yeah. But where is that in cyberspace? It doesn't exist. So how do we reclaim it? You want to talk about reclaim? I think that's a very important thing to do, but we have to know what to reclaim and how. How do we do it? Well, first of all, let's talk about net neutrality. How many people remember in 2009 the FCC's position on net neutrality? Does anybody remember that? We have any memory in this room? What what was it? They were trying to keep it. Uh, they were trying to uh, preserve uh, uh, uniform access. Okay. So effectively, in 2009, the FCC said the opposite of what they're uh, apparently being perceived to say today, which is we're all for it, right? We're all for net neutrality. What happened? Uh, they were, the court case said that they could, that was an infringement of a commercial contract. But what else was the decision? The, the other thing that was very important in the decision, and I want to point to this today, because 
there are places where we need to focus our resources and places where we don't need to focus our resources. And I say very uh, seriously, beware the thought misleaders. What Stanley talked about COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO is a way to infiltrate your mind to make you do the wrong thing so you don't do the right thing. And, and so the FCC didn't have the authority one way or the other with respect to net neutrality. Why? They don't regulate the internet. They don't, they don't regulate the charge for data tariffs online. They don't regulate anything. What they regulate is the physical lines, the rights of way, and the broadcast spectrum. And they have nothing to do with net neutrality. So today coming out about net neutrality and yelling at the FCC is meaningless. And it's a waste of effort. Yes? Uh, as long as the that is an important to what I think is true. true. The FCC can always regulate uh, the internet under Title II of the Telecommunication Act. They don't have to so, so we just have to. But they, they haven't exercised that, and, and whatever they said about the net neutrality, it, it already exists in uh, the business commercial practice for the the uh, companies as it is now, and the fact that they own the rights of, that they own the medium, it, they can control it. And that's really what it comes down to. So what I'm saying is, is, is really about, not about regulation, it's about the oligarchy. It's about the small concentration of power that owns, operates the infrastructure, and uh, how to control it. So what we as, and, and finally, just to make it clear that net neutrality is what's called a last mile issue. So last mile is the connection between the ISP, the upstream, and the, the, and the members. Um, so how to, how to deal with this is some of the things, now I missed the dark fiber lecture earlier, but uh, some of the things that we need to do, and, and I guess actually if I were to say that we were to update or clarify the First Amendment, it's not only about the freedom of the press. The First Amendment in a digital age is about the rights of citizens to build, own, and operate their own networks and to interconnect. Oh. The comments. And net neutrality is critical to that, but the way we achieve that isn't by just feeding the beast, but it's really by reclaiming our rights as citizens to build, own, and operate our networks and to fight the oligarchies. Now, you know, it's been said that the internet functions because of two things, rough consensus and running code. Right, everybody heard that before? Rough consensus and running code. Well, there's a lot of spirit and emotion and everything about how we as citizens uh, should be treated in cyberspace, uh, but really what it comes down to is running code beats running mouths. So you can talk all you want, but if you don't act, if you don't actually build, if you don't actually create things, and, and, and something that's sustainable, not a temporary autonomous zone, a permanent presence, a permanent community, then we're never going to achieve this. So what we need to do is, uh, I'm a pragmatist. For the last you know, 20 years, 18 years, I've been working on how to get this done. Now I started in the 90s with a project called Name.Space. And what happened was 1995 was a turning point on the internet because that's when it was allowed to do commerce. That was the EFSF's first mission, was actually to allow commerce on the internet, change the acceptable use policy. Also at that time was when the domain name started to be charged $100 for registration when prior to that it was free. So most people, being reactionary, said, we think it should still be free. We don't want to pay a fee. My question was, how does it work? And when I explored, thankfully, what is open about the internet, what is the commons, what is our, our right, is the open source code. Because the protocols of the internet are public, and then that we can take that and create something from that. So what I did while other people were building web servers, I was building domain name servers. And I was creating top level domains. And so in 1996, name.space was the first to actually crowdsource, create, run the infrastructure, build the registry software, create a who is, create URL forwarding, create zone editing. In 1996, we created .nyc, we created .art, we created .film, and, and with the wisdom of the crowd, 500 and some other top level domains. And we had these running in six countries. We had the domain re uh, uh, database replicated in six countries. We had the first real time registry and all these other things that we innovated, but we had one barrier, something called the root. Because when we first started the project, 
we didn't realize, everybody believed that the internet was a decentralized medium, that you plug in and then it works. It wasn't the case because there was a monopoly that controlled the central database of the domain name system called the root. And, and if you're not recognized in the root zone, your domains don't work on the rest of the internet. And so people say, well, why are the domain names important? Well, when I read about how Turkish government censors the internet, how people couldn't get on Twitter in Turkey or in Egypt during the Arab Spring is because they took over the domains. When people protested about SOPA, Stop Online Piracy, and PIPA, it was about domain seizures and taking down the domains. How do people in Turkey get around to Twitter? Well, what they did was they used open domain name servers and they switched their control panel. Guess what? That's how name.space had to do it in the 90s. So what we did then, people, there was a handful of people who were early adopters who did that. Most people, it's still today too technically difficult. But what we did <clears throat> was we asked the monopoly include our data. So we approached Network Solutions, now VeriSign, please add our data to the root so our domains work, like .com. And they denied that they had a responsibility, but of course they did. They were the ones who managed and changed the data in the root zone. So uh, my... Uh, partners and I, we had no choice except to file an antitrust lawsuit. And so we used the lawsuit that MCI used to break up AT&T against Network Solutions, and guess what? It stuck. They couldn't dispose it because we were right. And what happened with MCI versus AT&T? It broke up the phone company monopoly in the United States. With Name.Space versus Network Solutions, well, probably because the parent company of Network Solutions uh, at that time was SAIC, or Science Applications International Corporation, their board of directors includes people like Robert Gates, who was just the Secretary of Defense, but before, before that was head of the CIA. Uh, Bobby Inman, who was the head of the National Security Agency. This was run by the spooks. So in the end, what happened was we didn't win the lawsuit because, why? Not because Network Solutions didn't break the antitrust law. It was because they got immunity. Just like the illegal wiretapping with AT&T under the Patriot, before the Patriot, they got immunity. And then in the meantime, the ICANN was formed, the Internet Corporation for Sign Names and Numbers. I was part, I was part of that so-called multi-stakeholder process. It was a betrayal. This multi-stakeholderism is the oligarchy. And that's what our lawsuit is about now. We're suing ICANN now because they just raised the stakes for the top-level domains that only the 1% can afford. And it's run by the oligarchy and it's a bunch of insiders and we name names in our lawsuit and we're trying to reclaim what's ours. Um, so in the end, the only way that we're able to reclaim this or to build any kind of a democracy in cyberspace is to actually construct it. And so first thing we have to do is I ask you inform yourselves. I will be glad to share information. Name.space versus ICANN. We're now before the Ninth Circuit in California. Uh, basically ba what ICANN has done is they've absconded with top-level domains, including .nyc that we created, and they're handing them over to the, to the oligarchy, including Newstar, who's a, a former division of Lockheed Martin, and they just bought one of the largest uh, data mining companies in, in America that's undermining all your personal information and liberties. So supporting, supporting that, supporting ICANN, Google and Amazon, they're the biggest predators of our domains. If you look at, they couldn't even file to ICANN under their own names. Amazon's called donuts, like coffee and donuts, like they're the pigs, you know? And, and, uh, and Google went under some other name. I can't remember the, Charleston what is it? Charleston, Charleston Road. Road, thank you, sir. Uh, they couldn't even go under their own name. And then now we'll look at this consolidation because what this is is it's a vertical integration that harms the public interest. Why, and Amazon as well. Why should Amazon, who shut down WikiLeaks, have dot book. Well, fuck all you independent uh, book people. If you're not on Amazon, you'll never get your domain. And then if they want to cut down whether your access to your website is working or not, well, guess what? Or if you don't pay your fee in time, they take it. And same with Google. The domain, I mean, in the early days before uh, Prism and everything else, it got so all the data fusion and, and the waving of the rights and the, and the concentration of all your personal information on Facebook and everything. Before that even happened, Echelon was there. They used to use the domains because that's your metadata. Every time you click a link, every time you send an email, it does a source and destination. That's your metadata. Yeah? What do you think of name points? We've got to get on schedule. I'm sorry. Uh, I know we originally had an hour, but 
um, I'm sorry. Namecoin, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate what's going on in that whole realm. Um, but Namecoin, the interesting thing about it, I don't understand the monetary part of it fully, but that their notion of a decentralized DNS is what the name.space model was. Oh, yeah. When we advocated the shared registry, which, by the way, our lawsuit did lower domain registration fees and caused the wholesale resale market. So the fact that there is a GoDaddy or these other companies in business that resell domains is because we sued and broke the monopoly. I'm still broke. Didn't help me. Uh, but we have a more social enterprise model that involves our public commons and the public infrastructure that would give them a source of revenue. And so it's vital that not only we win the antitrust lawsuit against ICANN, but that people also realize that there are a lot of other things that we can do. I know that we're out of time. Um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I did want to get into some of the effort that I'm working to, to create a um, alternative last mile with the Wi-Fi and Y uh, broadband network, but I'll be glad to communicate with any of you offline. If you want to have my contact, uh, p please feel free. And uh, thanks again for your attention. And sorry, I wanted to do more Q&A and stuff like that, but you know, I, I don't want to take everybody's time. I know that there's a lot more going on, and I really appreciate uh, your thoughtful attention. Thank you.